Hey, I, and thanks for engaging. That's, a, that's an impressive uh, list of uh, credentials and, and, and pursuits. Uh, it, it, you, are you in Nassau or you're in or are you London? The major um, ban restrictions were imposed um, through Canada, so from London to Canada to Nassau, and I had to be like a permanent resident, but right. I was able to work my way through and I'm so glad to be home. <laughs> Oh, fantastic. I definitely want to thank uh, you for this opportunity to interview you, um, to kind of shed light on the budget and hash out some lines so that we can um, learn more about what the government is doing in this regard, and a special thanks to the ministry. I think, although it's a minute way of these one-on-one -on -one conversations, it's, it does show a long step in the government's commitment to for accountability and transparency and fostering a more dynamic civil society. Um, and as uh, our host mentioned, my question is about climate change, and then if I may go straight into it. Sure. Whereas we recently celebrated um, World Earth Day um, in the peak of the pandemic, that was April 22nd, and more recently we were celebrating World Ocean Day, um, I wonder what aspects of the government's budget speaks to clean energy investments, so for example, solar energy parks, um, and sustainable development when we're looking at protecting our ecosystem as well as how we are creating infrastructure that's sustainable during um, the hurricane season. Um, and as we are in the hurricane season, um, but are faced with these new prioritizations of the, the, the government's budget and resources with regard to COVID-19, even the previous hurricane, and, and a foreseeable recession, how are we ensuring in some that uh, our priority is still on um, trying to combat climate change, ensure sustainable development, and how has the government's budget increased or re been reduced um, due to our new prioritizations um, in comparison to your projections during your administration, as well as the previous um, administrations of the government? It's a loaded question. Yeah, so <laughs> it is, and, and, and it's one that is so very relevant and, and current to what is happening now because even uh, you know there will, there will be those who will tell you that what's happening with this virus and all the rest of it really has a lot to do with how we've been managing the environment uh, and so one thing leads to another uh, no doubt uh, you know coming from Grand Bahama uh, we are you know frontline soldiers uh, in, in this in this war against climate change um, which we actually call a climate crisis uh, we've had more hurricanes than and most of the world, quite frankly, uh, in between Grand Bahama and Abaco. So we know what the, what the effects are and, and the risks that are involved. Um, and we also know that uh, we have to build back uh, more resilient um, than we've ever done before, taking into consideration now uh, um, circumstances and, and occurrences that nobody uh, thought even possible. You know, I represent an area called High Rock, and it's called High Rock for a reason. It's high, it's high ground. Uh, but we had about 20 feet of storm surge. Nobody really thought about that. We, we build for wind speeds. So yeah, we got the 150 mile an hour wind speed being covered. Nobody considered what would happen with a 20 foot storm surge. So the, the, this has brought a whole new reality uh, to uh, the, the effort to reform the building codes, uh, where we can build, how we can build, when we are on flat, um, our low-lying ground um, and what kind of uh, structures uh, need to be built in order to be able to withstand all of these new dynamics. Uh, so in, in, from a national uh, perspective, uh, we have uh, renewed our um, uh, participation in the uh, catastrophic insurance fund, um, which costs us about $3 million a year. Uh, and this gives us coverage up to about $70 million a year, $70 million for uh, replacement of public infrastructure. So to the extent that we have damage, uh, we can have um, uh, funding to rebuild clinics, schools, roads, those kind of things. Those programs, uh, unfortunately, are never enough, just like any insurance that you take on your house or whatever. I mean, it helps, but it never really gets you back to where you were uh, in most circumstances. So we recognize that there's a gap and so we've been looking at uh, uh, some creative uh, financing instruments uh, that are out there, um, uh, catastrophic bonds, green bonds, uh, these kind of things that have a, um, a trigger 
so that so every year you would pay uh, the interest on these bonds that you would issue. So you issue hundred million dollars worth of bonds. You would pay the interest on these bonds every year. They have a maturity, say, 10, 20, 30 years, uh, and, and all goes well. The investor makes money uh, during that period because he's taking the hedge that no major storm is going to happen. Um, we're taking the position that if a major storm happens, then we're going to be able to cash in on these bonds uh, and, and have that money available to us. And this, the gamble that the, the uh, person who is issuing the bond has is that if an event happens, they lose their money. So, so they're compensated for that risk. Um, but for us, it, 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 it's an effective uh, hedge or insurance program uh, that is affordable um, um, over, the, over, the, over the, the medium term. Um, that's a developing area. We're still exploring. Uh, there are a few that have been issued um, and seem to be working. Um, but hopefully within the next year, the international community will, will, will get that a bit more formalized so that it becomes a more dependable, um, uh, predictable uh, um, instrument. Um, in addition to that, though, we have money in this budget for resilience building. We're doing a project over in Andrus to replant mangroves uh, as a buffer. Uh, and that would become a pilot project for all of our um, uh, near shore or onshore um, um, communities as we build out uh, some buffers to try and, 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 and lessen that storm surge. We also have uh, seawall uh, projects that are going on uh, uh, throughout the country uh, in terms of, of, of installing hard escape uh, uh, defenses. Um, and it, we have, uh, um, uh, in terms of our trying to reduce our carbon footprint, uh, we're doing quite a bit in terms of alternate energy um, uh, projects where uh, we're replacing street lights, uh, uh, where we, we're, um, uh, we have a, a project that's funded by the IDB uh, to uh, put solar on rooftops uh, and parking, parking structures, uh, government buildings, uh, particularly schools, uh, because schools are, are basically used in the day. Uh, so, you know, there's really not much of a, of a, of a draw because uh, the office equipment of that can really be done with solar. So we want to see if we can, if we can put them on. Um, uh, we also have uh, a project through BPL uh, to look at some of our smaller communities uh, to make them completely solar, uh, just take them off the grid altogether. Because part of part of the, the cost of BPL uh, here in New Providence is the cost to, to subsidize operations in the family islands. And some of these communities have less than 200 homes. It can very effectively be done with the solar, the solar plant. Uh, and so they're doing a project with that, um, supported by the IDB, and I think it's going to be really uh, interesting. Down in Ragged Island, uh, they've already, uh, well, they're almost completed uh, the solar plant there, which I think is going to be the first uh, in the regions for sure, uh, and maybe first in this hemisphere. And it's going to be completely new, uh, totally dependent upon uh, the, the solar plant. Uh, so we're very excited about that to see how that's going to work. Because that has a lot of implications for not only small communities, but also small islands. Uh, you know, you think about it, Athens or, or Iguana, you know, they have like five or eight hundred people. You know, these things can be very effectively uh, um, used uh, to support that and, and take a whole load off of us in terms of fuel cost, in terms of uh, the, the logistics, getting it there, the maintenance of that equipment, et cetera, et cetera. So there are a whole number of initiatives that are going on uh, to try and, and, and help ourselves, uh, both in the, on, on the, on the um, generation and the, and the pollution aspect, but also in terms of, of uh, strengthening our soft and hard defenses. That's really great. Um, I'm glad to hear that it still remains a priority. It was a priority yes. before coming into the pandemic, and it definitely should be moving forward. Um, and some of the projects you speak of are um, really innovative and um, resourceful in using our natural resources to combat climate change, I think is really, really um, exciting. But you did first start with the insurance, and I just wanted to piggyback on that because I went to a conference in London with um, my former employer, Thomson Reuters, and there's this spokesperson there, Daniel Greenberg, um, and um, he's basically a council, um, a, a parliamentarian uh, consultant um, and a, a major editor for the company. 
and we talked about basically global tax and the climate crisis that was occurring. Um, and at that time, we were just, it was in October, so we just experienced Hurricane Dorian. And I, all I could have think of is, the, well, obviously we had the need and demand for funds, various um, uh, NGOs and the private sector coming in and working together to do that. And the way that our government um, relies on quick, a quick claim would be through the insurance scheme. Um, and I'm just, I just was wondering if you think it's possible for, as opposed to relying on an insurance scheme where we are using our budget, potentially coming from loans and what's not, is there conversations happening at the global level or um, I guess, I guess the conversation I put towards him was a, uh, the polls I put towards him was a global tax in a way where there was the funds that are coming from, so that there's a pool of resources when a natural disaster occurs um, for governments to enter, to claim for, as opposed to an insurance scheme where we're putting forward money each year and some uh, given year we may not um, make a claim, but, and so on and so forth. Um, so I was wondering if, uh, if that's something that would be of interest to the government, but also when we're talking about natural disasters and how we handle it, um, I did have a follow-up question in terms of how we look at our data collection. I just heard, I think yesterday, um, Clint Watson was talking about a lot of the discrepancies in the number of lives that were lost due to Hurricane Doreen, and I was wondering if the government is... Um, investing in our data collection infrastructure to ensure that we know a, li um, a lot more um, so that we can um, address these issues when they occur. When it's a natural disaster and we're looking for um, individuals who have been displaced, whether we can use, for example, the driver's license, passport information data, and cross-reference that using advanced technology like um, face recognition to be able to identify certain people within certain shelters during crises. So basically, how is the government trying to um, invest in that kind of uh, technology so that it can be more helpful during these times uh, of crisis? Sure. Um, I, I don't know that um, we have done anything with first face recognition technology. That, that's an interesting uh, question. Uh, it's particularly one that I will, I will uh, look forward to um, along with our data people. But what we are doing, we've set up a disaster recovery authority, and they are now working in the disaster zone, Grand Maham and Abaco, to collect data on every man, woman, child that uh, is in that area, such that they can assess um, who uh, was there, who is there, and what their needs are. So that is a process that is uh, multi-agency, uh, um, involved with the social services, urban renewal, um, uh, the tax office, real property tax office, um, and, and all of these these um, entities to try and, and, and bring a, get a profile of who is there and, and, and what their circumstances are. That is going to help us not only um, determine what the, the needs are currently, but also, as you, as you rightly suggest, give us a database that we are able to utilize later on uh, for any number of reasons in terms of um, determining uh, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the upside uh, the, the requirements for schools and, and, and clinics and all the rest of it, uh, but also on, on the other side in terms of trying to, to um, work out what our risk profiles are uh, such that we can make sure that we have the kind of coverage that we need for particular areas. Um, the, there is a bit of a challenge uh, in the Bahamas because we are not a taxing state, we are a direct taxing state. There is a limited amount of information that is available, particularly in any one place. Uh, and so bringing this all together is a little bit complicated. Um, but hopefully, uh, we'll build up a um, uh, adequate enough database that we can make these kind of uh, uh, um, projections um, um, going forward, um, the, the, the idea of uh, using the tax base as a, a way of uh, uh, pushing or providing resources, um, the unfortunate thing is that most Bahamians um, don't, don't necessarily see the value 
uh, of the sharks until something happens. Uh, and so uh, trying to put another tax on, on them for their own good, for some future event that may or may not happen, um, uh, it, it's a very difficult sell. Uh, 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 Absolutely. I, def I definitely agree because we know for sure we are not the main um, contributors to this climate issue. Um, and I, I definitely would hope it wouldn't be a, an, a, an increase to that or anything like that. Right, right. Um, we were looking you know, we, you, you, one of the things that we've been thinking about, the mm -hmm. has created a way to address it, is to say, for instance, to, to rather than use the, the stick, to use the carrot and say to people, listen, okay, so if you take a private sector insurance, for instance, uh, we will give you a discount on your real property tax, right? Um, and, and so that would reduce the cost of taking that insurance and, and give you some kind of incentive. And on the back end, as, as the state part, would say that if you do not take private sector insurance, and because you're going to come to me at some point if there is a disaster, mm -hmm. uh, uh, we're going to tack on a percentage to your normal regular uh, real property tax. Uh, because you, you need to pay something. and you, know, you might not pay the full value of private sector insurance, but you need to contribute something uh, because there is a risk. And, and to the extent that you don't cover it, we have to cover it. And it's unfair for, for you, for instance, to uh, bear the cost of somebody who is being irresponsible, right? So, so we're looking at it um, uh, from that perspective, see how we can um, uh, encourage I, people. Yeah, I think to, I was just looking at a lot of um, the, to the bottom to top um, conversations when we look, for example, the Prime Minister of um, Barbados going to the Inn and making those demands for additional funding. We know that we aren't the main causes of this, um, issue um, and I guess looking at um, taxpayers elsewhere who are contributing to the issue through their consumption mm -hmm. um, how we can have that conversation at a, a greater uh, uh, international level right. the, thing, the, the thing about it is that uh, this is a this is an age-old problem that we have where you know we, we, we end up being the victims uh, of all of these activities that happen Yet the world doesn't necessarily see them, uh, their, or, or they understand their responsibility, but they are not prepared to take their responsibility uh, in any tangible way. Because, you know, for instance, we've been talking about um, since you won't give us any money, what about lending us, lending it to us at uh, concessional rates? And they're saying, well, you know, uh, you guys make a lot of money and compared to Africa or, or, or Haiti or whatever, so we can't lend you any money. And so then we're saying, well, but look, we're vulnerable. You know, these, these are real and present uh, dangers to us. Um, it, as we're seeing right now with COVID-19, uh, one blip can cause an absolute collapse. Uh, so we need to be able to protect against that. And so to the extent that we are making money or that we are able to hopefully save some money for these kind of uh, uh, prices, you want to be encouraging that um, uh, and helping us through these, uh, these creative instruments and low-priced instruments. But unfortunately, uh, you know, and, and, and uh, uh, Ms. Martin, Mr. Martin Motley has been an, an excellent representative and advocate uh, in, in the country, uh, in the region, uh, but even her, she's not getting the kind of traction um, uh, or response that we really all hope. One day we'll get there. One day, we, I, I'm confident we will get there, um, but it's been all of us as a region have to do it together, and we have to mature to the point where we trust each other and we go with one voice. Um, we're, we're not quite there yet. That was very insightful. I appreciate it. Thank you for the for the for the questions and the uh, and, and engagement. I wish you well. Uh, you, you sound like you're an engaged young man. I, I, I appreciate I'm, that. Uh, I'm trying my best, and hopefully, you can get encourage this for a lot of um, other folks in my generation. It was a real absolutely. pleasure. Absolutely, and I hope you're coming back home. I'm I'm here for good. Oh, excellent, excellent, good. good. Well, hopefully, we'll see you around. Yes, sir. Thank you so much.